If you happen to find yourself outside one evening in the next few weeks, and you glance towards the southern sky, you might notice two particularly bright stars. But these aren't actually stars. They're the two largest planets in our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. The brighter of these two is Jupiter, the most massive of the eight planets orbiting around our sun. If we look through a telescope, we can start to see that Jupiter is more than just a bright point of light. There is clear banding across the surface. We also see four more bright points of light, the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Galileo Galilei was the first person to point a telescope at Jupiter and notice these four objects that seemed to be following Jupiter through the sky, night after night. This discovery of bodies orbiting something other than the Earth was a major blow to the geocentric model of the solar system. If we had a more powerful telescope, we might be able to see an image like this. At this point, we can see a bit more detail in those bands that we noted earlier. The bands are formed by clouds in Jupiter's atmosphere. The high level of the winds forces these clouds into a narrow, well-defined band, the dark ones being called belts, and the light ones being called zones. But what if we weren't limited to looking at Jupiter through a telescope? What if we could actually travel to Jupiter? What would we see? Imagine we're in a spaceship, orbiting above the surface of the Earth. We set a course towards Jupiter and fire the engines. We arrive at Jupiter and enter into orbit around the giant planet. We see the familiar belts and zones, though much more clearly now. In fact, recently NASA's Juno spacecraft was orbiting Jupiter and was able to take some stunning images. The Galilean moons are all interesting in their own right. Let's take a short flight over to the closest orbiting of these four moons, Io. Io is the most volcanically active body in our entire solar system. Being about the same size as our moon, this is somewhat unexpected. Such small bodies should have cooled down long ago to the point of being geologically dead. So what is keeping Io so active? The gravitational tug of war between Jupiter and the other three Galilean moons, much as our moon rises the tides on Earth, Io has tides arising from Jupiter, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These tides are constantly stretching and squeezing Io, causing frictional heating under its crust. This creates enough heat to fuel Io's unprecedented level of volcanism. Let's continue our journey to Europa. Europa is interesting because it contains a liquid ocean underneath its frozen crust. The ice is heated through the same frictional forces that heat Io. Interestingly, when the Voyager missions passed by Jupiter, no plumes were observed on Europa. More recently, however, water vapor was detected about a hundred miles above the surface of Europa, so a potential mission could be launched to orbit Europa and to search for microbial life in the oceans. Next, we will visit Ganymede. Ganymede is the largest of the Galilean moons, and in fact, it's larger than Mercury. 
The only reason that Ganymede is defined as a moon and not a planet in its own right is that it is orbiting a planetary body. The IAU, International Astronomical Union, adopted a three-part definition of a planet. To be defined as a planet, an object must a. orbit the sun, b. assume a hydrostatic equilibrium, meaning that it is nearly spherical, and c. have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. This means it's gravitationally vacuumed the excess gas and dust in its orbital path. Ganymede only satisfies two of the three definitions, so then cannot be called a planet. Ganymede is the only moon in the solar system that has its own magnetic field. This causes auroras near the poles. Lastly, we will visit Callisto. Callisto is Jupiter's second biggest moon and is our solar system's third biggest. Its core has long since cooled down and the surface is littered with craters from the heavy bombardment period. Without molten material to refill these craters, the surface of Callisto has remained largely unchanged for millions of years. Initial data from the Galileo spacecraft indicated that Callisto possibly contains a liquid ocean but more recent studies have brought that into question. Perhaps a mission to the Galilean moons is in humanity's future, but there are many interesting moons and many more planets in our solar system. Let's head back to Earth. The other bright point of light in our southern sky, Saturn, is extremely interesting because of its well-defined ring system. Again, Galileo was the first person to document these rings in the year 1610. With modern telescopes, we might be able to see a sharper image, but when Galileo first trained his telescope on Saturn, this is what it may have looked like to him. Galileo's initial inspection led him to believe that there were three bodies orbiting each other, and in his journal he actually indicated three separate spheres. In the 410 years since the discovery of Saturn, it has undergone much study. Today, if we were to point the Hubble Space Telescope at Saturn, this is what we would see. The Cassini spacecraft was able to orbit Saturn for 13 years, collecting detailed data on the planet and several of its moons. Let's get a better idea of the view that Cassini had. Saturn has seven rings and many gaps that make up an intricate and beautiful display. There are 53 known moons, and with a startling 29 moons awaiting confirmation, the number of confirmed moons could shoot up to 82. These two moons, Prometheus, the inner moon, and Pandora, the outer moon, were once thought to be shepherd moons, but recently, Pandora's effect on the F ring was shown to be negligible. Prometheus actually is very chaotic and will pass in and out of the F band due to its precession. Next, we will travel to Mimas. That's not a moon, it's a space station. Mimas is another one of Saturn's inner moons. It is tidally locked, which means that the mass is not evenly distributed across the surface of Mimas. The side that has more mass has a stronger pull of gravity, and thus always faces Saturn. Mimas's most distinguishing feature 
is the large crater, named Herschel's Crater after William Herschel, who discovered Mimas in 1789. Herschel's Crater covers nearly one-third of the face of Mimas when looking at it head-on. Next, we will travel to Enceladus. Enceladus is perhaps the most biologically intriguing moon in our solar system. This is because it has a vast ocean beneath its surface. It is warmed by frictional forces in much the same way that Europa and Callisto are. Enceladus is different, however, because some of this liquid is being launched into space at nearly 100 miles per hour. Some of that freezes and falls back to Enceladus, but much of it actually falls into orbit around Saturn and forms the E-ring. Additionally, there has been some evidence of hydrothermal vents deep in the oceans of Enceladus. The combination of organic molecules, water, and hydrothermal vents are all components that partially led to life here on Earth, and many organisms still survive in the heat of the hydrothermal vents here on Earth. This makes a very interesting case for searching for microbial life on Enceladus. Finally, we will visit Titan. Titan is the largest of Saturn's moons, and it's the second largest moon in the solar system. Titan is the only moon in the solar system to have a substantial atmosphere. Although due to the incredibly cold temperature of space, the atmosphere is mostly made of nitrogen, methane, and hydrogen. Incredibly, Titan is able to support a water cycle much like the one here on Earth, except instead of water, this cycle is made up of methane and other ethanes. There are rivers, oceans, lakes, clouds, rain, snow, and any other type of precipitate you can think of. Additionally, Titan may have a liquid water ocean beneath the frozen methane and ethane. Given the potential liquid water ocean, Titan may be able to support life as we know it, and given the rivers, lakes, and oceans of methane, it may also have the potential to support a vastly different kind of life. Let's go back home and see what else we might find in our night sky. Even though they are not visible to the naked eye, the other two giant planets in our solar system, Uranus and Neptune, are also above the horizon in the nighttime hours right now. If you have a telescope, you might be able to catch a glimpse of these two, given their distance. They aren't the most spectacular sights to see. Let's get a better view of these two worlds. Uranus was theorized to have been hit by an Earth-sized object in the planet's distant past, which is why it is observed to rotate at almost 90 degrees. This causes some pretty extreme seasons on the surface. Uranus has an orbital period of 84 years, so one pole will be in complete darkness for 21 years, have normal day and night for 42 years, and then be in direct sunlight for 21 years. Uranus has a system of 13 rings and 27 known moons, which are all named after characters from the works of Shakespeare and Alexander Pope. Uranus has only been visited by the Voyager 2 mission and has not been largely studied. Finally, we will visit Neptune. Neptune was the first planet that was discovered through mathematics rather than through observation. 
Neptune has between five and nine rings in its system and has 14 known moons. The Voyager 2 mission is the only time that Neptune has been visited by humanity, so there is still much to learn about it. One of Neptune's moons, Triton, is especially interesting. Let's take a closer look. Triton is the largest of Neptune's moons, but it is surprising because it is the only known large moon to orbit around a planet in the opposite direction of the planet's rotation. This is what astronomers call retrograde orbit. This led scientists to believe that Triton was actually a large Kuiper Belt object, similar to Pluto, that was gravitationally captured by Neptune. Due to gravitational decay, however, Triton's orbit is getting ever closer to Neptune. Eventually, the gravitational forces on Triton will cause it to tear apart, perhaps forming a ring system to rival that of Saturn's. Now, let's head back home. In October, Jupiter and Saturn will be the brightest objects in the southern sky in the early evening. Jupiter will rise first and lead Saturn on its western path. Uranus will be at its closest to Earth on October 31st, so if you have a telescope handy and want to stay up into the spooky hours of Halloween, then point your telescope at the constellation Aries at around 1 a.m. to see Uranus at its perigee. That means its brightest and largest appearance. Lastly, Neptune will be at its highest around 10 p.m. in October and is located in the constellation Aquarius. 